Welcome. 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 Welcome to the Panama City SDA Church. Bienvenidos a la Iglesia Adventista de Panama City. Welcome to Panama City SDA Church. Our goal is to live and work in God's purpose. Our mission is to equip, support, and inspire women. Our goal is to help women learn their gifts. Come join us. Our goal is to live and work in God's purpose. Our goal is to help women discover their gifts. To live and work in God's purpose. Our goal is to help women. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Bienvenidos a la Iglesia Adventista de Panama City. Okay, listo. We hope you enjoy today's program. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Now, I will welcome you in my dialect, but I have to look at the cheap sheets. I've been here 40 years. I forgot how to say it in my dialect. I have to ask my kids. Anyway, maayong bunta, gumuli pa yung adlang ipapahulay, mga igsoon diha ni Kristo. Giabi-abi ko kamong tanan, ni ining special nga adlaw. Nagpasalamat kita sa ginoo, sa tanang panalangin nga iyang gihatag kanato sa tibuok si Mana. Hinaot nga kitang tanan mabulahan sa programa nga giandam alang sa matag usaka ninyo karong adlawa. Daghang salamat. In short, I hope you will all bless with the service today. Buenos días, eh, queridos hermanos, familias en Cristo, en esta mañana hermosa, un sábado especial, un sábado más. Queremos darle una cordial bienvenida a todos. Siéntese gozoso y en, en, disfrute nuestra programación especial de esta mañana. Welcome to church, everybody. In Jamaica, we would, um, of course, the, the language is, is English, but in part where we would say, Wagwan, everybody good? Good morning, everyone. I was getting a little too excited too early. What's up with that? But I have been looking forward to the Sabbath day because I tell you, these last six weeks have been crazy for me. So God is good. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. So happy you're here. Um, let's do our um, invocation. Can we all stand up, please? Lord, thank you so much for being here today, for being with us this week, for allowing each person to walk in here and those who rode their wheelchairs in here. We thank you for being here. Lord, bless this whole Sabbath day. The food, the people, Miss Cynthia over here and her husband. Lord, thank you for traveling mercies. Lord, we are excited for what you have today. Continue to let your blessings fall on your holy Sabbath day. And we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' precious, precious, and wonderful healing name, amen.
know, it's beyond our type, you know. And Frank and I were dinks. Double income, no kids. And, you know, we said yes, no problems. And, you know, time went on, and we had two boys. And then we decided, you know, I need to be a stay-at-home mom. And I decided to stay home. Two weeks later, uh, Frank's company got bought out. He was working for him. We lost the company car that we had, and they totally closed the office here in Panama City. Now, you have two parents unemployed, you know? We sold our home in one week, a cash offer, and more than what the real estate agent wanted it to be uh, for when we list, list the house then. And then we moved in with mom and dad, okay? And um, after Frank sent out 250 applications to get a job, we finally answered a tiny little ad here in town, and God wanted us to stay right here in Panama City, not move to Tennessee, where we wanted to be in Nashville, okay? You know, and um, it was turning a nonprofit organization into a profit organization. Then the owner decided, years later, to uh, sell it to a larger company. Again, we had to sell our home. And this time, we lost $10,000 because, I don't want to go into that, but the Lord made it up twice on the other end. You know, we purchased a home for a, they had just lowered the price. It was awesome. Okay. And then again, the company wanted to move us uh, to another area that had issues and Frank would do better at that, at that. So we were going to move to Dallas. And at that point in time, there was a bidding war for a house, and God took care of us again. You know? Um, we've always had funds to pay our bills. You know, we always had food, you know, a house to live in. We always had cars. We, we've had everything we'd need, you know. And we'd, first, we'd always pay our tithe and our offering. That always come first, no matter what. And what was left over was left over. But you know what? Sometimes your toilet paper lasts longer. Your food lasts longer in the cupboards. The Lord is going to just take care of you. Totally about that. It's Malachi 8. What's well, Malachi 3, 8 through 10? What does it say? Test me. What does it say? Try me now and prove me now herewith, you know. You can never outgive the Lord, okay? You know, th and this is our offer call for today. It says women are specific specifically, let me get that word out, the designed by God to meet the needs of other women. What do you think? Uh, that's a true statement. You know, uh, women's ministries, you know, is the best way for us as a, to connect with the, you know, unchurched women is how, what it is. And to introduce them to who? Introduce them to Jesus, right? And across the North American vision, the North American vision is like the United States to Canada, Canada to Bermuda to Guam, what's it called? Micronesia? You know, the Women's Ministry Church is engaged in serving others, and they do it by, you know, Bible study, and they have evangelistic series they hold, and they do families in need, you know, bags of love, and, you know, people on our shores that come here for a refuge, and um, just, you know, tutor classes, and uh, English, a second language, and they all, just all kind of things that we do. You can't begin to say it all. You know, even when COVID got us down, you were able to plug in with Zoom, and you have, you know, prayers online, and you had um, worships online, and you had, you know, could teach and do everything online, and then now we're up and strong and running again. You know, the devil tried to get us down, and we're back at it. And if the deacons would come on forward, um, they're not deaconess, come on. <laughs> and, you know, Ellen White urged in the year of 1898 to establish women's ministries. And... Um, the, uh, the funds were for evangelistic outreach and events and leadership and training for the women, you know, for to help us to stay on track together. He wanted us to, us to be unified and for us to all be teaching and saying the, the same things to each other. We want to stay on track with the Lord. And um, these women's partnered with God in serving through ministries that seek to encourage, equip, 
and challenge girls, teens, and young adults and women to grow deeply in God and serving him uniquely with their gifts and their talents. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. Thank you, my Lord, for everyone being here. And you know our hearts, Lord. Help us to be able to give to your cause whenever you, the Holy Spirit, talks to us, Lord. Help us to be able to answer your will. We thank you so much for hearing us in our prayer. Amen. Happy Sabbath to all of you. I wanted you to notice, I believe these were placed in your pew uh, near you. These are prayer cards, and there's a prayer box down below. If while I'm speaking, you have a prayer need and would like to have your, your needs addressed today and probably throughout the week, please fill this out and bring it at any time down to the box and insert it there. Uh, the announcements for today, the Pathfinders Campery is at Alamisco this weekend, and uh, please keep them in your prayers, uh, Miss Jessica and the rest of the leaders. Uh, after church today, after the service, there is a fellowship meal, and you're all invited. Today, uh, the Christmas choir rehearsal is at 2 p.m. in the sanctuary, and everyone is invited to join them as well. We have a very busy, active church, so we're so grateful for all these things, all these opportunities. Today, the women's seminar is at 5 p.m. by our guest speaker, Sister Cynthia Sierra, and refreshments will be served at the end. Spanish translation is provided, and you're asked to please wear your uh, women's ministry's lilac t-shirt, and if you don't have one, wear something purplish, if you like. And if you don't have one of those, then just come. You're welcome. Don't miss out. Uh, tomorrow is an opportunity to serve and to mingle with your uh, community in a way that uh, you can bring Christ to them. It is an I Am My Brother's Keeper annual event from 3 to 5. The address is in the bulletin, and your bulletin is full of activities you will see throughout the week. Not everything I'm saying is on there. You have much more. Uh, there is going to be a short meeting after the service today down front for those that are interested. And uh, before you go to lunch, please stop by real briefly. It will be a brief meeting. And you're invited to all of these events. And what is it that we say here in our church? We connect, we equip, and we grow. Thank you, and God bless. Happy Sabbath, everyone. At this time, we're singing the love of God. You can sing with us. Thank you.
nervous as I am. You're pretty nervous. But you know, we're so thankful for the Sabbath rest in Jesus. There's a song that was written many years ago, and some of you may remember it. The Gaithers sang it, and it went all over this nation. And the title of it was Learning to Lean. We're learning to lean on Jesus. And you know, us women really have to lean on Jesus. We're wives, we're grandmothers, we have children, we have jobs that we have to go to, we have houses to keep clean, we have meals to cook. So we really need to lean on Jesus. Is that correct? Is that amen? And so the song that I have chosen for our special today is I'm Learning to Lean by John Stallings. And it's dedicated to all you women. Happy Sabbath. Learning to lean on Jesus. That's why we're here. That's right. You know, in Christ, Objects Lessons, page 250, Sister White says, prayer brings Jesus to our side and gives the fainting, perplexed, 
soul, new strength to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Prayer turns aside the attacks of Satan. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, in the, in the book of Second Kings, and I'm not preaching, the story is told of an encounter with King Sennacherib and Hezekiah. You know, Sennacherib sent a boastful threat to, to God's people. And um, how did Hezekiah respond? He laid it before the Lord. And in 2 Kings chapter 19, Hezekiah took the letter and he spread it before the Lord. And he said, Lord, open your eyes and see. Open your ears and hear. And in response to Hezekiah's prayer, God sent a word through Isaiah that said, that which thou hast prayed, I have heard. Amen? Amen. Today, whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before the Lord. And the way will be opened to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger you will become in his strength. Amen? And that's coming from the Zara of Ages, page 329. This morning, you were told to fill your prayer requests and drop them in the prayer box. We're asking you, spread out your case before the Lord. Whatever those anxieties are, whatever those challenges are, we invite you to fill them out on, the, on those requests and drop them in the prayer box so that the prayers publicly you can declare that the Lord is my strength. And he will hear and answer your prayers. You know, um, maybe your prayer is a praise song. And not a request like Miriam who said, Sing to the Lord for he is mighty and exalted. The horse and the rider has he cast into the sea. This morning we're praying. Sister Pembleton and myself. And uh, we're praying for the Lord to hear our prayers. You can kneel where you are. After the song. our Savior, and our Lord. Thank you so much for the privilege of calling you Father. You're just an awesome, mighty creator of the universe. And this morning, we worship you, we exalt you, we magnify you because you're worthy and you deserve all the praise. Lord, we come as your children. We're nothing at all before you. And we don't come because we're worthy. We come because you are worthy. And you invited us to come to you as men, women, children. You know our needs, Lord. Way more than even we know them ourselves. So we are asking you to address those needs individually and collectively as a church. We pray for unity among each of us. Lord, you said you pray that we may be one, even as you and the Father are one. Oh, Lord, just Hold on to us, Lord. Even when we're pulling away from you, hold on to us. We pray, Lord, for the speaker today. We pray that you will anoint her from the crown of her head to the sole of her feet. Bless her abundantly, Lord. The words that she speaks will transform lives. Lord, and give us a, Lord, give us a heart for mission and help that we might leave this place transformed going out to make disciples of other men we worship you we give you all the praise and we ask for your blessings on this service be with each visitor or there, there are persons here who, who, who come searching for answers to life's problems oh lord please reveal yourself to them in an uncertain way today we thank you for hearing our prayers and we thank you for answering in jesus name loving father we want to pause a little bit longer 
at your feet. We thank you that you're here and you listen to us individually and collectively. Lord, we've placed our prayers here at your feet. You know each of our needs. You know us from the, the very hairs on our head. But Lord, we want to tell you that we love you first. And we also want to say, Lord, we thank you for choosing us to be part of your family. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be the better Christians that we need to be in order to draw others to you. We thank you that you have given us the desire to be here and to learn more about your love and your plan for salvation. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be witnesses for you, both here and abroad. We pray, Lord, also that you would help us as we uh, choose the mission that you have given to us, that we may take it and that we will tell others about your soon coming and that they will show the, we will show them our love and they will want to be with you also. Thank you for your, your son, Jesus, that died on Calvary, that gave us that connection back to heaven. And when, we come, when you come again, may we all be waiting for you. In Christ's name, amen. And Lord, how could we complete this prayer without addressing the petitions in the box? Lord, you know from where they came. You know the challenges, the finances, the health situations. You know the children situations, the family situations, whatever those are. Please address them, Lord, today and let someone go home victorious. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading is in 1 John 14 to 11. First, I'm going to read in Spanish. En esto consiste el amor, no en que nosotros hayamos amado a Dios, sino en que Él nos amó a nosotros y envió a su Hijo en propiciación por nuestros pecados. Amados, si Dios así nos ha amado, también nosotros debemos amarnos unos a otros. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son us as atoning sacrifice for our sins. They are friends. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one. Amen. Cynthia Sierra is a dedicated, licensed clinical social worker in the state of Florida and Atlanta. With 15 years of experience in the mental health field, her primary focus is on families and children. She is also a devoted pastor's wife, sharing her life journey with her husband, Pastor John Sierra. In, in Dothan, Dothan, Troy and Mariana, together they form a dynamic team providing spiritual guidance and support to their community. Cynthia is a loving mother of two boys, aged 12 and 22. She finds joy in journeying in nature, with attending to her garden, hiking, or even sitting outside in her spare time. Cynthia created motivational contact through her Instagram and YouTube channels, Faithful Mama Life. She inspired, up, she inspired and uplift women from all walks of life. Her content is a blend of faith, resilience, and practical wisdom. Reflecting her own journey as a woman, wife, mother, and a professional, and a professional. But before she come to us with the word from God, we will have the song of meditation. Then the next voice you will hear is of our dear beloved sister, Sister Cynthia. Please keep her in your prayer. A woman's prerogative is to change her mind. And we are changing our minds this morning. And I'm thankful that you have been patient with us. The song we're going to sing now 
was sung at the Women's Ministry Conference in Orlando, Florida. And uh, it's titled, Coming Together. And that's what we all want to do, is to come together in unity. Happy Sabbath, church. I like that. You know, at my church, they probably get upset with me because if they don't do it right, I have them do it over. So I didn't have to do that, but I want to do it again. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I am so thankful and blessed to be here today. My name is Cynthia Sierra, and I don't know if they have, yep, they have my beautiful family is up there. My husband is here with me today, and I will tell you, he wasn't supposed to be here, but I will tell you how uh, God made that work. And so uh, there's my family that was at our previous church. Uh, my son, Azariah, who's the little one, who's, he's not little anymore, he's huge, 12 years old, and my older son. Uh, he's my stepson. So you're like, how does she have a 22 year old? She looks so young. He, uh, he's Liam. And so we're so proud of him because he joined the police department over in Orlando where we live at. And so that is my beautiful family, including my handsome husband. And so I am so thankful for being here this morning. I feel blessed. I feel energetic. I feel rejoiced. I'm anxious. Like I am ready to go. So before I forget, let's bow our heads to have one last word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for allowing us to be here today, Lord. Although it's been gloomy and rainy the last couple of days where I'm from, Lord, I praise you because the sun is shining this morning and we have warmth, Lord, and we are here alive and breathing. I ask you that you be with me, that you be with the words that I may speak, Lord, that they may be your words and not my own. I ask you, Lord, for the people, the listeners here, and those that are listening on the internet, Lord, may you open their hearts and their minds to what you have to tell them this morning, Lord. Although this is a women's emphasis day, Lord, this message is for everyone. We pray that you be those that are still not here or those that are on their way. And most of all, Lord, hide me behind your cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So who likes stories? I love stories. And so I promise eventually this is going to tie in into today's message. And so we were driving this to this morning. And how many of you have had a difficult week? I know Miss Luisa, the pastor's wife, told me she had a difficult week. Yeah, I, it was just praise God that I am here this morning. Um, I go to the gym, you know, to try to be healthy. We believe in the health message. And I was trying to do Zumba for the first time. Let me tell you, that Zumba was killer. It hurt my knee. And so I couldn't work out anymore, but I'm stubborn and I decided to go ahead and do another class. Well, guess what? My other knee gave out. And so I was not able to go and work out at all. The other thing that happened to me this week was my back. Uh, I had a pinched nerve on the right-hand side, so on Tuesday I went to physical therapy. I felt great, and so I was like, let me be a good wife, and I'm going to help my husband in the yard, right, because we share we share chores, so he'll do dishes sometimes, and I go outside, praise God, right, for a husband like that. And so I felt really good, and he's like, you really shouldn't be here. You just, like, got your back straightened out. But I was like, no, 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 I'm going to help you. That night... Not only did the right side hurt, then the left side 
hurt. And it wasn't just like a pain, it was a pinched nerve. And it's been going on for four days. This morning I was like, Lord Jesus, help me walk so that I can give this message today. And so Satan has been working tremendously hard for me not to be here to share this with you. The last thing that happened was, and this is why my husband was not supposed to be here. I was at an appointment Tuesday morning and everything was fine. I turned on my car, pressed the brakes, right? And the brakes went all the way down to the floor. Kind of sounded like a def. Look at your piece, like, whoa. It would sounded like a deflated tire. And I know that wasn't right. Now, I don't know anything. I'm not a mechanic, but I know that when you press the brake, it's supposed to kind of stop, right? And it was not doing that. So I called my husband and I said, listen, babe, I'm here at the doctor's and I need to make it home. And he immediately was like, well, go on the slow lane because I kind of speed sometimes. Go on the slow lane, stay on the right hand side and try to press your brake slowly. If it doesn't, press the emergency brake. And I was like, okay, so I'm going to do that. I called the mechanic. The mechanic was just down the road. He was able to go ahead and take care of the car. And we're like, no problem. My husband has a three-district church. So he has Troy in Alabama, Dothan, where we live at, and Mariana, Florida, which he was supposed to be at today. Well, the part that we were supposed to get for my car to be fixed didn't come in. It was a day late, I think a day or two days late. So we're like, what are we going to do? I need to preach over here. You need to be over there. What are we going to do? And so praise God, uh, they were having homecoming in Mariana. And so he was able to come with me and support me. And so that's why he is here this morning. The drive here was amazing. It was great. And so I praise God for that, that I'm here with you today. So I have a question for you guys. I know that some of our kids are over at the Camporee, but how many of you guys have kids here? Is there a parent here? Any parents here? Yeah. Okay, so you, <laughs> you may relate to my story, and this is where we're going to get into, into it. I promise we're going somewhere with this, okay? Um, when I was a kid, I was not the type of girl that wanted kids. I was like, it's not happening. It's not me. I never wanted to have two or three kids. I never really wanted to be, oh, he's looking at my husband. It changed, obviously. <laughs> I didn't I didn't want to be a wife. I didn't want to be a homemaker. It was just not something that attracted me. It wasn't interesting to me. Uh, I never really played with dolls. I just, my mom had bought me a, a one doll. It was like very big and it was the type that cries and, and laughs and moves and stuff. And so I usually changed her clothes and I just put her on my bed, right? Well, the reason why I felt like that was because my mom was a single mom for most of our life until she married my stepdad. And I saw how hard she was working. She would have one or two jobs. We'd be home alone sometimes, alone eating ramen and ravioli. Um, and so I was like, if this is what motherhood is and this is what it's like, I kind of don't want any of that really. I, it's, it's too hard. I, I don't, I don't want it. And so move forward. I finished college and, um, I got married with my husband at 23 years old and I met him and I said, you know, I love you. We're going to get married. And it, it happened very quickly because when you know, you know, and so I'm not recommending that for everybody, but when you know, you know, and so we got married what, in six, six months. We said, I love you in two months. It was like, no, no time to waste. So uh, got married at 23, and I told him, listen, I love you. We're going to get married, but I really don't want to have kids. It's not something that I'm yearning for. It's not, you know. And for him, of course, it was like, well, that's, that's fine with me. You know, if you do want to, if you don't, it's no problem, because he had a son already. He had an 8-year-old son at that time. So for him, it was no problem. So we continued in our careers. He worked uh, in HR, and I was doing my therapy thing. And then something happened. I got this thing called the baby fever. <laughs> and oh my gosh, how many of you ladies have gotten that baby fever? Oh yes, all of a sudden it's like, I need to have one of those. Like I need to have one. I was like, I don't know how we're going to do it. Well, I do know how we're going to do it, but we got to figure it out. What every couple does, we started trying and trying and trying. And so it was already, again, I told him, there's one thing, I need to get pregnant by, by 25. So we had, what, an, a year and a half, maybe two years to get this thing going. 
And we tried and we tried almost a year, and there was nothing. Um, I think the problem was because, as a therapist, I was doing what's called fee-for-service. Fee-for-service means where you go to the home and you get paid depending on your clients. So I would see a child and get paid. If I did not see that child, they weren't there for any reason, I wouldn't get paid. So I had to pretty much double book. And so all this stress and anxiety really affected my body, and I just couldn't. So we prayed about it. We decided that I was going to get another job. And so I started working for the Florida United Methodist Children's Home over in Deltona, Florida. And it was great. They had a beautiful... Um, acreage and I was able to do my therapy with teenage girls and it was awesome. It was awesome. And I was walking because they had a huge campus. I would just walk around the lake and do my therapy. And honestly, since we had tried so long, I didn't really, I put it out of my mind. I said, I'm stressed out. I'm not going to worry about it. And so during therapy one day, I felt sick. And so I went home and I said, well, let me, you know, go ahead and do one of these tests. I, I hadn't done one before. And I was with my sister and we did it, and guess what? It came out positive. I was so excited. Of course, my husband wasn't home yet, so I waited for him to get home, and I was like, guess what? I'm pregnant. And he was like, really? Let me see the test. And I showed it to him, and he was like, is that from Dollar Tree? I said, yeah. <sighs> and I'm like, but it's still legit. Like, it's still, he was like, no, no, no. You need to go to the store. We need to get one of those that, like, says it clearly. What is it called? The clear blue, and it says pregnant. And so I did it, and sure enough, I was pregnant. And we were so excited. It was amazing. I did it right before my deadline of 25 years old, and everything was going great. And we were just like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. I'm going to have this baby. I wonder if he's going to look like you. I hope he looks like me. It's going to be wonderful. And then the advice came. You know, the advice that everybody loves to give new moms. And so uh, the first one, I think, was because uh, we wanted to have a, a girl, but praise God, I had a boy. Said, well, you know, <laughs> not because girls are tough, but because he's a mama's boy. And he's like my, my baby. So they were like, you know, I hope you don't have a girl because girls are tough. And it is so tough to raise up a girl in this environment and, you know, so much peer pressure. And it's just really, really hard. And then you have the other side. Well, I hope you don't have a boy because they are trouble. They are difficult. They're just so hard. They're stubborn. But you know what? I did not care because I was having my baby and I was so excited. And it didn't matter what anybody said. We just pushed it away because this was going to be my baby. And so there was nothing that anyone can say he was mine. And it didn't matter that what he did. I don't even care, you know, what he may do in the future or anything because I already loved him. And whatever he did, there was no mistake that he could do that I wouldn't forgive, right? And so isn't that something like we, like I just found out I was pregnant and I'm already loving this, this being that's inside of me. It's like instantaneously. And so that leads us to today's title, a love that precedes our choices, because that's what happened to me and my son, right? I loved him before I knew what was going to happen to him. And so let me ask you, have you guys ever heard the word prevenient grace? Prevenient, meaning the main word. Has anybody ever heard that? Okay, good. I didn't either until I started doing my sermon. So prevenient grace or prevenient means preceding or coming before. And so this means that it's preceding or coming before. So that means that God's grace comes before whatever we choose, whether it's right or wrong. And so John Wesley, who was uh, the founder of the Methodist Church, started this idea, and it was a dispute of the salvation of doctrine. And the idea is that divine grace precedes our choices or comes before. So God begins the process of giving us grace, showing us love, regardless of our choices, meaning there's nothing that I can do that will keep God's grace from, from me. And so I think this is a beautiful thing, knowing that I can do right or wrong, but God's grace is still offered to me on a daily basis. Isn't that great? And so it goes before us, and it begins the process of love. 
and restoration. You know, it's amazing how this whole day has kind of been culminating together because I had a sister up there. She probably didn't know I was listening, but back there in the Sabbath school talking about love, they were talking about love up here. And it's just, it seems to be the theme for today. And so the work of the Holy Spirit in that love is what convicts us and it's what transforms us and it's what causes us to repent, right? Because God gives us that grace regardless of our choices. But does he want us to remain there? Mm -mm. No, but he gives it to us because we are born sinful and so that's why we need to repent. But through God's prevenient grace, we begin to see the difference in that good and evil and that's when we're able to make our choices. See, his grace drives us and it propels us and it allows him to work in our hearts and in our lives. The grace that God gives empowers us to take the steps towards him. Without that Holy Spirit, do you think that you can do it out of your own will? No. You have to have that grace, right, that God gives you and the Holy Spirit that's working through you. And so this reminds me of the story of Rahab. How many are familiar with the story of Rahab? Some, maybe, most of you, yeah. So it is a beautiful example of grace and the love that is initiating, that God wants to initiate that relationship with humanity. And so if you remember the story of Rahab, she was an idol worshiper and she was also a pagan. But you know what the amazing thing is that God didn't look at her background. He didn't say, you're not doing things right, you're not worshiping me, therefore you don't deserve my grace. He didn't care about her beliefs, and most of all, he didn't care about her profession. Because for those of you that don't know, Rahab was not doing very good things. She was uh, maybe sleeping around, or however you want to call it. She was doing unethical and immoral things. And so he didn't care about her profession. He still wanted to give her that grace because he loved her and because she was his creation. He wanted to save her. You know, this reminds me as a mom, my my son always gives me crafts, right? Well, now he's 12, so they're different. But he used to give me these crafts, and he made me a little dish. It was red, white, and blue Play-Doh dish. And he said, I want you to take this. And he made it with his hands, and he was so excited. And people who looked at it were like, what is that? And I'm like, this is my son's craft for me. And for him, he created it with his hands. It was so special to him, and it was special to me, right? That's how Rahab was in the hands of God. He created her so special, and he didn't care what anybody else thought about her. She was his creation, and he took full responsibility of her. Isn't that amazing? He didn't blame somebody else for her, you know, for her idolatrous ways. He didn't blame somebody else for causing her because who knows what her childhood or her upbringing was that she chose that profession. He said, I will take responsibility for her. I know that that's my creation and I take responsibility for her. And so we go into our Bibles in Ephesians 2, verse 8. If you guys want to look it up, I'll give you a couple seconds. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10, and that was a scripture that was read today by our lovely sister. And it says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So basically, what this verse is telling me is that I'm not saved by what I do or what I didn't do. I'm not saved by my choices, but I'm saved because it was a gift from God. Who likes receiving gifts? On my birthday, I get all of my free birthday gifts. Like, I go to, where do I go? I go to Ulta. I go to Sephora. I go get my free Starbucks. I go get my Dunkin' Donuts. God is giving me a free gift. There's nothing that I can do. Here's the truth about God's character. Before we chose him, friends, he chose us. Amen? He initiates that contact. He opens the dialogue or the communication. And he is relational. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That's why God couldn't be by himself. He needed Jesus and he needed the Holy Spirit because he is relational and he wants that with us. Sometimes we think, oh, well, I came to God. I I chose God. And yeah, that's right. But you couldn't have done it without who? the Holy Spirit, 
right? And so God is the one that opens up that dialogue, that opens up our hearts to say, you know what? What I was doing, I kind of don't want to do anymore, right? And so that's how that change starts. And he will do whatever it takes to restore us. Amen? And you know, God has been trying to restore us ever since when? The Garden of Eden, right? After they sinned. Our relationship has been broken. Ever since then, he has been trying to restore us with his love and with his grace. Amen? And so the love that precedes choices in our lifestyles is what God is offering to us today. And so in the story of Rahab, it shows that prevenient grace or the grace that comes before our choices. If we go to Titus 3, 5, and I will give you guys a couple seconds because I don't like it when preachers or speakers move along so fast. Titus 3, 5. And it says, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so, you know, sometimes we kind of gloss over that word mercy. It says he saved us by mercy. Well, in my mind, I'm thinking mercy may be kind of like grace, forgiveness, right? But being the good student that I am and having a pastor husband, I decided I was going to look up the word mercy. And let me tell you, amazing. It says, compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it's within one's power to punish or give consequences. So what this is telling me is that God could have punished me or given me consequences or destroyed me, but he chose instead to give me compassion and forgiveness. That's all I get. Amen. Amen. He could have destroyed you, but he chose to give you compassion and forgiveness. Praise God, right? And so I went a little bit further, right? Because this was good, but I went a little bit further. I'm Puerto Rican, by the way, if anybody. Yeah, okay. So I went and looked at the medieval Latin, and the word is merced or merces. And y'all, it means prize paid. Amen? So that means that mercy is the person that could have destroyed me, given me consequences or punished me, gave me instead compassion and forgiveness, and he paid the price for me. Praise the Lord. Now do you know why I get so excited about the word mercy? I will never think of that word the same again. And so we could have a whole other sermon on that, baby. You taking notes? <laughs> it's amazing. And so the mercy or that gift that was already there was given to us freely. I didn't work for it. I didn't, I didn't even need, I didn't even earn it. Like there was nothing that I did because I know that as soon as I was born, I was already sinful and that grace was already there when, before I was born in my mom's womb. And so the Holy Spirit had already been reaching Rahab, which is an amazing thing. And so when she heard the miracles of Jesus, she would believe. She was able to believe because she saw where she came from, who she was, and now who she is through Christ. Amen? And so she made the choice to accept God as her true God. And so if you remember, she was pagan, right? She was an idol worshiper. She didn't really know who God was. And this shows that God's love precedes even the choices of pagans. Amen? She had faith and waited for God's power to deliver her. And towards the end, she claims the God of the Israelites as her own God. In Joshua 2.12, she says, The Lord your God is God in heaven and above and on earth below. And praise God. We don't even want to talk about the family dynamics that were going on there. We already talked about her profession, right? And so... She now wanted to save herself, but she also wanted to save her family. And so this was a person that was the lowest of the low. She was probably pushed to the side. Kind of reminds me of the Samaritan woman had to get water in the middle of the day. In, in Florida and Alabama, it gets hot. So it gets really hot. And so you imagine her parents probably ousted her. They, she was an outcast. 
They didn't care for her. And of course, she was a woman, so she was worth like nothing. But she still chose to reach out, and she wanted to share that love that God gave her with other people. And so I think that is a beautiful thing. And so in Rahab, God's grace in the form of the Holy Spirit preceded her decisions. Amen? He works in our hearts to soften our sinful nature also. Uh, So we're inclined to choose God. And I love that because he reconciles us. He wants to restore us. He wants to reconnect. We broke that bond. It wasn't him. We broke that bond, and he wants to come back with us. And so I love it because God knows no boundaries. I think I heard somebody, I think it was here somewhere, we we were talking about boundaries this morning too. And so I'm a therapist, and I love boundaries. Like, I need to compartmentalize my clients and my home and my church, and I'm all about boundaries. But praise God, because he has no boundaries. Because the walls that I'm trying to put up are the walls that are already up. He's knocking them down, okay? Because if there was this boundary, I couldn't get to him. But he's like, no, we're going to push that aside, and we're going to have this connection. Praise God, right? And so his love dares to go to places where it's not wanted, because sometimes we kind of want to be alone. We like to, you know, linger in our sadness and our isolation sometimes. But God says that his love wants to go where it's not wanted. And so the question is sometimes, you know, with this love, we're supposed to share it with others, right? Now it's going to get a little hard now. Don't, don't throw the stones. Why is it easier for us to judge people rather than to love them despite their behaviors? Because if we want God to love us, right, regardless of our past, regardless of our errors, why shouldn't he have that for other people as well, right? And so we as Christians can sometimes be blinded by our sinful nature. Jesus wants us to feel love, but there's an enemy who wants us to feel hate, jealousy. It's a big thing today, especially among women. Contention, discord, and judgments. And so we may feel more spiritual than other people, uh, maybe we that don't share our beliefs or that don't know as much as we, uh, but we need to remember that 1 John 2, 6 says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So if we're claiming to be Christians, right, we need to act like Christians, right? If we want to claim him, we need to also claim his character at that, right? And so this brings up a good question, If we need to be sharing with other people, and God loved the pagans or the sinners, so how do we define a sinner? Sometimes people are judgmental because it creates a sense of safety or comfort for ourselves. Maybe a person feels better than others because they gain a sense of validation. Or maybe it's in an attempt for us to decrease our feelings of inferiority or worthiness. I'm just speaking truth, y'all. It happens to all of us. It is our desire to feel better than other people, right? Because nobody wants to be, like, at the bottom. Sometimes we want to feel valuable or accomplished, and this is simply our sinful nature because, as I talked before, we were born sinful, right? Unfortunately, I was one of those, and the person that I hurt the most was my sister. I'm the oldest. I have a middle one and then a younger one. It was my middle sister. And I would bully her and I would cause her to feel so bad about herself. So bad about herself that even as an adult, she would still feel that way. She had self-esteem problems and she was married. She had kids. But what I was doing as a teenager I thought it was just natural, you know, um, sibling, sibling issues. And it wasn't until I grew up and we talked about it and praise God, you know, I, God has changed me because from 15, 20 years ago, I'm different, but I wanted to make myself feel better. I wanted to feel good, you know, not knowing that I had low self-esteem and that's why I needed to have her feel worse than I did. How many of us sometimes do that? And so we love to celebrate competition and comparison. I'm on Instagram, and it's easy for you to scroll and see the beautiful lady with the beautiful makeup and the nice family, and everything's great, but you don't know what's going on in the background. 
You don't know how many times she had to take that video or that picture or that her marriage is breaking apart or her kids aren't listening or, you know, fill in the blank. And so we judge and measure success and failure by what we see. And so James, in James 2, 4, writes about this. He says, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And so he continues to rebuke them and reveals their participation in prejudice, favoritism, and bias. And so if we are to be like Christ, right, does Christ act like this? Does he have favorites? Is he biased? Is he prejudiced? What if he would have just kept his his message to the Jews? You know, what if he would have just kept it to his people, to the learned of society, to the ones who had it all together, had it all together, and not gone to the Gentiles? My friend, y'all think we would be here today? Mm Mm-mm. Praise God that he doesn't have favorites, right? Praise God that he does not have bias and he has no prejudice. And so we may not want to admit it, but sometimes it happens even in our churches. We don't judge based, or excuse me, we do based on, you know, perception, on outward appearance, the way someone talks, the way what whatever someone is wearing, especially women, if their skirt is too tired, too short. Uh, maybe sometimes it's even an accent or simply just their outward appearance. Um, maybe if they look and behave like us, we'll welcome them and happy Sabbath and we're having potluck over and we may even sit with them and stuff like that because we're Christian, right? But if they're different, we may still say happy Sabbath and hi, how are you? We may invite them to potluck, but we kind of keep them kind of at bay, like, "Mm, you're kind of not like me, you know, but I'm Christian, so I'm saying hi, right? And so this is what God does not want. I was watching a show a couple years ago, and it was talking about uh, different people. And there was uh, two ladies. They were given something to read, and it was funny. They were given something to read. One of them had an English accent or British accent, and the other one had a Spanish accent. I'm like, okay, where is this going? Well, they read the exact same thing. They were dressed the exact same way, but the survey showed that the person... uh, people thought that the person that had the British accent was smarter than the person who had the Spanish accent. There was something about the way the English lady spoke or something that made it immediately, oh, she must be smarter. But they both had the same degree. You see, and that's how our mind, unfortunately, our sinful mind works, that we are prejudiced and we stereotype things sometimes without even noticing it. And so back to the question, how do we define sinners? Because if we believe humans are fallen beings, then we're all sinners regardless of our choices or regardless of our appearances, right? Romans 3.10 says, there's none righteous, not one, not you and not me. So we all are in need of God's saving grace. Ellen White in the devotional, Our Father Cares, page 104 says, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you'll appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer. And some of them, it's like, whack, it's a smack in the face, right? Because we're perfect. We, we got it all together. I go to church on Sabbath, and everything is great. And my dress is below my knee. Like, we're good, right? Right? But if we want to really refine our characters, We need to spend time with Jesus. And it's okay if we get slapped in the face sometimes because that means that we're growing, right? We're all in need of God's grace. And it's not by our own works. It's not by good eating. I've been a vegetarian for 12 years, praise God, and working on veganism. But man, I love that cheese. And so it has nothing to do with being vegan, although vegan and health message is great. It has nothing to do with our church attendance because, amen, we know the true Sabbath, but is the Sabbath going to save you? No. There is nothing that we can do that will save us. It's only through Christ's grace and his blood. Can you save your own self? Can you? I mean, you have blood, but can you save it? Can, mm-mm. No. Praise God for that. And so this should humble us when we're trying to share with unbelievers or those who believe differently than us. We must see them through the redemptive lens of Christ and how he sees us, and we have to reach out to them with his love. We see Ellen White writes in the book Evangelism, 
Love must be the prevailing element in all our work. In the representation of others who do not believe as we do, every speaker must guard against making statements that will appear severe and like judging. So even if they appear like you're judging someone, maybe it's better just to stay quiet. She says, uh, present the truth and let the truth, the Holy Spirit of God, act as a reprover and as a judge. But let not your words bruise or wound the soul. So how many times have we done that? How many times have we wounded or hurt or bruised someone else without knowing it? Or sometimes, let's be real, on purpose, right? If we turn over to 1 John 4, verse 10 and 11... 1 John 4, verse 10 and 11. And we're going to start with verse 10. And it says, This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so what verse 10 is telling me is that God loved me first. And so he loves us even though we are unlovable. My friend, you are unlovable. Okay, you may think that your family loves you and that's great and your friends and your kids. But the reality is that we are naturally unlovable. But God, but God continues to love us. If we move over to verse 11, it says, dear friends, since God so loved us. And it's important for us to take that little word so and translate it in that way. And so when we read verse 11, it says, Since God so loved us, we also ought to love in that way one another. Meaning if our God loved us in this way, we need to love others in that way as well. And let's admit, it's easy to love those that are lovable. It's easy for us to love those that we love. So family and friends and close relatives, you know, our kids. It's super easy. And God knew this. In Matthew 5, 47 mentions that even the Gentiles love those who love them, right? Like, if you love me, I love you. Like, that's super easy. But to love the way Jesus loved, that's a little bit different. Because Jesus loved, even on the cross, those that were persecuting him. Those that had beaten him and hurt him. Those that had turned their back away from him. And his last words were still a prayer for them. Matthew 5, 44 and 45 says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. But no one here has enemies, right? Like we don't, we don't have any of that. And so to love like God is to love those that don't make it easy for us to love them. It could be a person that hurt you. It could be someone that embarrassed you. It could be someone that used you, that talked about you, or violated your trust. I am huge on trust and honesty. But God is telling me that I need to love that same person that betrayed me. And so I'm going to tell you, I'll be honest, I had to do that. I was married before, and I got divorced at 19 years old, and I married a Christian man. And let me tell you, to forgive what was done was only through God and the Holy Spirit. Because for me, he didn't deserve it. But you know what? It gave me so much peace and love, and I just handed it over to God, and that burden was just lifted. And so he asks us to love people who think and behave differently than us. Not saying that you can't have those boundaries with difficult people. And this is also not talking about people who have physically or mentally abused you. That is a whole separate category. This is talking about just people you may not like because of something that they have, you know, done to you. This is talking about Christians who don't share God's love because of differences. I'm not going to share my love with you because you treated me bad last Saturday. You didn't say hi to me. You didn't care to like come over and sit down with me. You ignored me. Okay. That's, that's, that's how petty it is sometimes. And so what if God gave up? 
my friend, we would not be here today. If God did not take Cynthia, wherever she was at, 15 years ago, depressed and doing all the kinds of things that I was not supposed to be doing, I would not be here today. If he was focused on what I had done, but praise God, he doesn't care where I was. He knows where I'm going to be. And so if you told me, what, even 15 years ago, I was going to be married to a pastor, (laughs) and I was going to be a pastor's wife, I would be like, you are crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. That is not the Cynthia that is here today. There's the door. I have no idea. But praise God, because he knows our potential, even before we know our potential. Okay? And so that's why I don't believe it when people say God or the angel, your guardian angel stays at the door. You're going to the bar. You're doing your thing. He stays at the door. I don't believe that because you know what? I was doing all that and God still went down to pick me up from that. And so if it wasn't for him reaching out, I wouldn't be here today. And so don't let anybody tell you, even in your poor situation, in your bad choices, that's when God tries to get you the most. Because just as God is trying to get you, guess who else is trying to get you? Okay? And who are you going to? Who, do you think Satan is? You have a sermon on this, babe. Who do you think is more powerful, Satan or God? Because in my life, God is more powerful than Satan, right? Only through God's grace can we love how he loves It's a lifetime work of sanctification, and it doesn't come from us. The Holy Spirit is the one that removes pride, and it replaces it with a forgiving, a kind, and a patient heart. This year, I've been praying for God to give me gentleness, gentleness, because as a Puerto Rican, sometimes I could be a little bit sarcastic, and I have to be like, Lord Jesus, make me a Christian, not a Puerto Rican, because... (laughs) I've been praying for that. And only the Holy Spirit is the one that can remove that from me. Rahab trusted and loved God. And that meant that she loved and cared for others so much that she bypassed whatever her family was talking about her, whatever they may have said about her, whatever they were thinking about her. She was just like, listen, I have found this God and you need to come here with me because he's going to deliver me today and y'all need to be ready. Amen. Is that the kind of love that we have for our brothers and sisters? God loved her so much. And she loved others, and that's why she wanted to share that. And I'm almost done, guys, but let me ask you. If someone you knew was in the hospital and um, you don't like them, they did something to you, whatever it is, and they asked you to visit or to pray for them, what would you do? Somebody said pray. Pray. How should you respond? See, because what we want to do and how we should respond, sometimes they don't really correlate. It's a little bit different, right? God tells us to forgive seven times 70, right? Because he continues to pursue us. Shouldn't we also continue to pursue and forgive others? It should be our privilege to love the same way that Christ did. And so, yes, we should pray. We should pray. But we need to meet people where they're at. And we need to journey with them. Okay? Maybe God had something to tell you, something for you going to visit that person. In your mind, you're like, yeah, I'll pray for them. But, you know, they did this and that. And they they just, you know, carried on the other day. Should that matter? Does that matter to God? Because they're still a child of God, just like you are. We need people. We need to meet people where they are at. Not think about where they were but know that God knows where they're going to be. And so to be like Jesus, we need to proceed with love and that grace and that kindness and that patience even before that person makes the right choice that we think is right. So God calls us to a life of love deeper than our feelings and emotions because as a therapist, my friends, your emotions sometimes are not accurate. They're depending, your emotions and your feelings are depending on maybe your past or what you're thinking or what you're assuming. The kind of love that God has for us shows commitment. And we need to make that decision to serve God and our neighbors. 
our neighbor doesn't mean the person next to us. It doesn't mean the person that we love. It doesn't mean our literal neighbor in our house. It means everyone that needs God. Everyone that you come across with, whether it's shopping or getting your nails done or your hair done, whether it's at an appointment, are we sharing with other people like if they're really our neighbors? This love drives us to work for the well-being of others. And so it means loving those that are easy to love and those that are difficult to love. And so today I have an appeal for you. What work of love do you need to do today? If unhealed wounds plague your relationships, just call on Jesus because he seeks you to find that healing that only comes through him. If you have unresolved conflicts or problems with people, Jesus calls you to work them out because tomorrow is not promised for us. You need to restore that relationship. If you're struggling with a certain person, I challenge you to take the initiative. Oh, but they were the ones who wronged me. It doesn't matter. If we if 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 God waited for us to like try to initiate that, my friends, sometimes we're just so stubborn. We're like, I don't want that. So if you're struggling with a person, you need to do whatever it takes to try to take care of that today. Here's a big one. If we're holding grudges or resentment, Confess them to the Lord. You may not get an apology back from that person. They may not even talk to you. But you know what? If your heart is right with God and you've confessed it, then that's all that matters. And you need to put whatever else has been hurting you behind you. If you're struggling with still comparing people and judging others, I ask you to pray that you may see them the way Jesus sees them and humble yourself. Sometimes the biggest thing for us to come to Christ is we just don't want to humble ourselves. It is hard to put yourself down because it makes you feel weak. But Lord, the Bible tells us that when we are weak, that's when he is strong, right? And so praise God for that. If you're ready to make these changes today, I ask you guys to stand up. If you're ready to love your brother or your sister the way Christ loves you, if you're ready to put down any hurt, any pain, any wounds, just anything that has happened in your past, and I'm sure that as I'm talking, there's things coming up in your mind. Maybe a person, maybe a memory, maybe a time 20, 15 years ago that somebody hurt you, and you're still holding on to that, and you feel, no, I've let it go. But if it's still there, my friend, you have not let it go. If you're struggling with a person or maybe a situation, whether that person is still living or they have passed on, you need to give that to God. Because God gives us prevenient grace, which is a grace that goes before our choices. It goes before our decisions. It goes before we even choose to do right. Because sometimes right is really, really hard. Just like loving people is really, really hard, right? And so we need to pray this morning that the Lord allows us to love people the way he does. And I ask him that all the time when on the road and somebody cuts me off or when I'm in line and somebody skips in front of me or when I'm trying to say something and somebody just ignores me. God knows our hearts and he knows that it's difficult, but he tells us we don't have to do it alone. We have him. And when we put our burdens on him, man, our burdens get so light. God loves you. And we need to share that love and that grace and that mercy. Remember, compassion and forgiveness that he gives us with other people. And may God bless you guys. And as we call on his strength and love, may we show grace to others. And he who calls us to love will enable us to do it. So let us pray. Dear Father God, we just praise you and we thank you because of your love, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, Lord. You loved us so much, Lord, that you took down all the boundaries. You took down all the walls, Lord. You loved us when we were unlovable. You met us where we were at, Lord, and and you knew what we were going to become. We praise you, Father, because we don't need to do this alone, but we have you, Lord, and we have the Holy Spirit that helps and works through us and just sheds our sinful nature, Father. 
we pray that you put your love for people in us, Lord, that we may truly be called Christians and live by that name and share the love that you give us with others. I pray that you bring to our memory, to our hearts, Lord, all those people that have hurt us, and may we release them to you. May you show us love to love truly the way you want us to, Lord, and we ask all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can we all say amen? amen? Our closing song is page 457. It should be on the screen. I want us all to sing within our hearts. I love to tell the story. Okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for this year, Holy Sabbath day. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Help us, Lord, to love each other because you are all compassionate, pure, and unbounded love. You are, you are. Please visit us with thy salvation. We praise you for your mercy. We invite you to enter every trembling heart today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.